We've got a really cool texture to make today. This video is all about making sci-fi, circuit board, computer chip patterns, while also showing how you can create really complex patterns with just a few nodes. We also talk about how you can select individual pieces and apply specific actions to each of them. Let's get started. Okay, so we're in Substance Designer. Let's create a new graph here, and I'm gonna use the PBR Metallic Roughness template. And let's start with a graph name. I'm gonna call this Sci-Fi Circuit. So we're gonna set this to absolute, and I'm gonna change the width to 4K. We got a lot of detail going on, so I wanna get that going straight off the bat. And 16 bits per channel is good, so let's hit okay. And right away, what I want to do is create what I call my final blend node. And it kind of ties all of these outputs together and makes it easy to work on the height information right away. So I'm going to hit spacebar, add a blend. And I'm going to pipe this into the normal conversion node. Then I'm going to delete my ambient occlusions uniform color there and create a, an ambient occlusion. Put that into the output and put our blend in there. Don't worry about it yelling at you. It's just looking, It right now it's thinking that it needs color information, but we're gonna feed in some grayscale information in a second. Down here at the height, let's remove that uniform color and put our final blend into that height output as well. So overall right now it is looking like this. So I'm gonna right click on this final blend and just add a comment and call it Final blend, just so we can keep track of that. So to start making these patterns, let's hit spacebar and add a tile random node. And you can see where we can get the idea of these base shapes for the circuitry. We've got these random tiles and it's sort of giving you that overview of a city or a microchip in which we have these different divisions. And it has a bunch of great parameters that we can adjust. So let's pump in our tile random into the foreground of our final blend. We can see what's going on in our 3D view. So while we have some height information here, I'm gonna go into the materials tab in our 3D view, go to default and, and under the shader properties, I'm gonna to go to tessellation and I'm just gonna put this up to 24. Seems to work well for my machine. If that's too much, you can just dial that back and then I'm gonna increase the scale. And as I increase the scale, we're gonna see some real height happening here on this 3D cube. If you don't have the 3D cube, you can go to scene and choose rounded cube here. Great, so I've got my scale around 5.25 for now, but I know I'm gonna adjust that later, but so that we can see some height information, that's looking pretty good. Double clicking on the tile random, let's look at some of these properties. I'm gonna slide over this a little bit so we have some more room. So I'm gonna keep the X and Y amount around four. I'm gonna scroll down to the size parameters and I'm gonna decrease the random X from 0.5 to zero. And I'm gonna increase the random Y all the way up to one. And now one of the features that distinguishes this tile random node is this inner stice property. And you can see the mode says relative to largest brick. And what we can do is we can increase and decrease the amount. And what that does is just adds or subtracts the amount of space between each of these blocks or bricks as it calls them. So starting off here, I actually don't want that much of a space between each block. So I'm gonna lower this down. 0.3 for now, that's good. Then like most parameters in Substance Designer, just because the slider is all the way at the top doesn't mean you can't go higher or lower than what it has set by default. So for the scale, I do wanna increase this a bit because you can notice as I decrease or increase this scale, we can't go any wider. So let's increase this to something like two. And you can see that's too much now because we've lost all of our definition. So if I bring this down, just a bit, now you can start to see some of these fine lines connecting these shapes. So I'm gonna leave this here at about 1.09. After the tile random, I'm gonna add a mirror grayscale. And doing this helps with repeating patterns and also getting some uniformity going on. So we have a mirror grayscale here, default where it mirrors across the X axis. I'm gonna move these over a little bit, select the connection between the mirror grayscale and the final blend and add a bevel node. So I'm gonna zoom in a bit so we can see what we're doing. So if I decrease this distance a little bit, 
you can see that the bevel node is really good at making paneling for a lot of sci-fi looking textures. So if I bring this down to something like 0.7, this is starting to look like some sort of paneling either on some machine or some walls. I'm going to go to my materials and go to edit. That's the same thing as going into the shader and choosing tessellation. And I'm just going to increase the scale just a little bit so we can see what's going on. So I'm going to increase that. And you can see we sort of have this cool paneling effect going on with this bevel node. So instead of having a positive value in which the bevel is occurring outside of the shape, you can also decrease this value into the negative and the bevel is gonna occur on the inside of the shape. So as you see, as I do that, now the shapes are beveling inside, preserving the amount of space around them and we're getting this really cool effect. So something like negative 0.04 is looking good here. So by adding this bevel node, we've added some grayscale values to our black and white mirror grayscaled image. And what this does is allow us to use a curve node to adjust these grayscale values to add even more detail. And I talk about the curve node in one of my earlier videos where we make this picture frame utility node. I'm going to link it in the top right, but also down below if you want to check that one out. We talk about some functions and some really cool stuff there. So I'm going to make some more room after this bevel, and I'm going to add that curve node. So let's make some room here. And so this is where we can define the curve and almost sculpt it as if we're looking at it from a side angle. So if we take a look, keep an eye, I'm gonna zoom in over here on our shapes and then take a look at the 2D view while I do this as well. So I'm gonna double click to add a point here and move the bottom all the way in. And that's gonna sharpen up the lower values, the darker values, and just bring this sort of up and over. Maybe I'll keep this one down and then add another point and bring that up. When you select these points, you have these options here. So I can choose to make this a sharp curve or maybe or round it off like that. Just adjust these points while I'm looking at the 2D and the 3D view and seeing how it's altering things. I'm gonna move around here a bit so I can get an angle that I'm comfortable with. Let's add another point bring that up. Maybe this will start going down. You can see we're getting a defined lip here. Bring this up. And I think I've gone too far up here, so I'm just going to select all of these and bring those down and over, readjust. And then I know I really want to add one more point and bring it further down. So I can add this sort of cage or bigger lip around there. Looks a bit more sci-fi. And then what I could do is just sort of space these out depending on how I like them. Let's make this point sharp. Great, so you can see this is the profile that we've created and it looks very cool. Don't forget to save. Okay, so we've made this really cool pattern with our curve. Now what I wanna do is blend in a shape that's gonna help this tile and splatter around better. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. So we're gonna to continue to make some room. To show you what I mean by that, I'm going to change my scene to a plain high res. So here's our high res plane. And what you can see is that this particular texture as it stands extends all the way to the end of our map. And what I want to do is actually chop off a bit around the border so that when this tiles around, we don't have any issues. So this will make a lot more sense as we go along. So I'm going to add a blend here. And it's going to take everything off of our plane. I'm going to set this blend mode to min darken. Again, shouldn't see anything. What I'm going to do now is click onto the graph and hit spacebar and add a shape node and put that into the foreground of that blend. So everything's back. And notice if I go into this shape node, double click on it and take the scale and decrease it. It's gonna start chopping off the ends of our pattern, giving us some space here. So I'm gonna set this scale, something not, not too cut off, but just enough. 0.96 is fine. Just wanna add that extra little lip around the texture. I can double click and you can see what this looks like in the 2D view. And I'll hit spacebar and you can see how this is starting to tile. And finally, to put these base shapes together, we're going to add a tile sampler. 
And so this automatically put the connection into the background input because that is the default input for tile sampler. But I'm going to hold shift and left click and bring this up to pattern input one. Right now you can't see that pattern. So let's double click the tile sampler, scroll down to the pattern section and choose pattern input. Now this might look a bit strange and pretty cool, but let's zoom in and we can see what we've got here. We can see that our tile sampler is cloning our pattern a bunch of times in this grid. Let's adjust what's happening here in the instance parameters. So let's severely decrease the X and Y amount of tiles that we have here. I'm going to choose, let's go eight by eight. And I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom actually. So we can see what's going on here. And there's this parameter called color parameterization mode, and we have it set to color input and we don't have a color input right now. So let's change this to column index. Now, nothing's happened, but that's because we need to drag this slider for the color parameterization multiplier and bring that all the way to the right to one. So in the 2D view, you can see based on each column, we've got a different shade of gray. And that translates to our height by making each of these columns a bit taller as we go along. So that's pretty cool. But now what we really want to do is randomize this and scale them up a bit so they can create these complex sci-fi shapes. So with the tile sampler selected, I'm going to scroll back up and I'm going to increase the scale property. So as I do that, these shapes are going to start running together. And that's actually giving us a pretty cool pattern. You can see we're getting these different sort of panels going on here. So I'm going to increase it to something like Let's say 2.49 looks great. And then the magic really happens here. And we go to the position random and I'm just going to move the position random slowly and you can see what's happening here. I'm going to switch back to the rounded cube. So I could definitely do this all day. This is where you can really arc direct and customize and create the type of pattern that you're looking for. Okay, so I think I'm happy with how that pattern looks right now. And so one more thing that you could do is you could adjust this under position. You can go to the offset and you can drag this in and skew the tiles just a bit more if you want to. I've got a habit of just making this offset 0.5, but it's totally up to you. And so, yeah, this is the pattern that we have right now. So to finish up this base shape, I'm going to move everything over one last time here. I'm going to say one last time a bunch. So next up, I want to add some visual rest to this texture. As cool as it is, I think it's looking a little overly busy. So to narrow it down a little, I'm going to add a levels node to focus in on what I want for my base shapes. So after the tile sampler, I'm going to select that connection, hit spacebar and add levels. And so levels is great because it, it does everything that a histogram scan would do or a contrast and brightness node would do, but with a bit more fine control and we can see our histogram here. So really all I want to do, and I'm going to keep an eye on my 2D view here, is I'm just going to bring this top left triangle over to the right. And you can see how it's narrowing down our shapes and it's really defining which of these patterns we want to keep and which ones we want to sink into nothingness. As a guide, if you're following along, I'm going to bring this triangle right above this line here, the third to the right. I think that's going to be fine for me. And so you can see it's gotten rid of some of our patterns here, but that's good because we're going to add some smaller micro detailing here. So to keep organized, I'm going to select the nodes that we've created so far before our final blend there, hit spacebar and frame them up. And I'm just going to call this base shapes. So next up, I want to create these cool wiry cages and micro details and add this into the mix with our sci-fi circuit board texture that we're creating. So first thing I'm going to do is add a histogram select. So I'm not going to select anything at all. I'm just going to hit spacebar, histogram select. Now histogram select is going to be our MVP for this whole material. It allows us to narrow down a particular range in our histogram so that we can easily select different patterns. And this lets us create some masks in a very selective and refined way. I'm going to select the levels that comes out of our base shapes frame there. So I'm going to put that into the input of our histogram select. I'm going to double click on it so that we can see it in the 2D view. And 
check out what this does. So I'm gonna zoom out here and watch as I drag this position, you can see that we're just going through the histogram and through this particular range that we have set by default, we can see where all these patterns lie in their grayscale values. And so what I think I'm gonna end up doing is dragging this position slider all the way to the right so we have a value of one. And we get these particular patterns and they're what I wanna work with next. So leaving everything else by default, I'm gonna add an edge detect after our histogram select. And so let's take the edge around this and bring that all the way to zero. And notice what's going on here. We're starting to get that circuit board like pattern. So to refine that a bit, I'm just gonna bring the edge width down something like 1.29 looks good. And now it's really starting to look like a circuit board. So after the edge detect, let's add a bevel. And I'm not gonna use this bevel to chamfer the edges of my extrusions. Instead, I'm gonna use its smoothing option. So I'm just gonna double click this slider here. And that's an easy way to select this value on your keyboard and then just type in zero and hit enter. So really what I wanna do, and if I zoom in here, you can see, is just use this smoothing option that it has. And it creates these really cool artifacts as you smooth. So I'm gonna drag the smoothing just a little bit to the right and you can start to see it's creating these really cool shapes. So if I drag this back a little more, we're getting this square-like angular pattern as we start to smooth these edges. So I think what I wanna do is leave this at around 0.55. That's looking pretty good. So now I wanna start blending on what we've done to these shapes onto the rest of our material. So I'm gonna select the connection between the levels and the final blend here and add another blend. I'm gonna set this blend to min darken. And then I'm gonna take the result of our bevel here and take the height output and put that into the foreground of our blend. So I'm gonna double click the blend, keep the opacity at one, and it's gonna zoom in here and just take a look at what we've done. So you can see these are the shapes that we've created with that new edge detect and bevel that we've done. We've added these sort of wiry cage shapes. And that just adds a tiny bit more detail to the mix. So I'm gonna zoom out a bit in my graph make some more room by just taking our outputs over and just dragging this over here. I like to create this sort of blend line. So I'll create like a component and add a blend up here and just keep bringing this on. So it kind of mimics the idea of adding layers on this timeline sort of effect. And that'll make more sense as we go along, but it keeps me organized and it might keep you organized too. So let's move this down. And so the next component that I wanna create is this micro wiring. It's really cool and really easy to set up. And it's gonna add some really awesome detail to this blank space that we have in our texture. So I'm gonna take this histogram select that's coming out of our levels node, and I'm gonna drag another connection off of it and let go. I'm gonna type in blur. Now I'm not using a high quality blur and I'll show you why. Let's dial in a value here, bring down the intensity quite a bit. And so this is the result that we get with our blur. If I took out a blur high quality and take this down to a similar value, the blur high quality has a much smoother blur, whereas the regular blur has this angular artifacty sort of look. And that's really cool. And that, that really matches what we're going for with this particular texture. So I just wanted to illustrate the difference between the regular blur and the blur high quality each have their own purpose and uses in the texturing process. But today we're going to go with this regular blur. So I'm just going to delete the blur high quality grayscale and we have this one. After the blur, I'm going to add a quantize grayscale. And we've used this a couple times before, but I'm just going to adjust the quantize amount so that we can get just a couple different shades of gray here. I think I'm gonna stick with six here. And that gives us a couple of gray values to play with. After the quantize, I'm gonna add another edge detect and bring the edge roundness back down to zero and then dial down that edge width. So we've, we've just added a few more wires to our circuit board pattern. Gonna stick with a very small edge width here. And then after the edge detect, 
Now I'm going to use my blur high quality grayscale and take that intensity very far down because what the edge detect does is it really aliases our lines here. We've got these jagged edges. And I know from experience that if we just use the edge detect, we have these aliased lines, we're going to get this tearing effect and it's not very pleasing to the eye. So what I'm going to do is take the blur high quality grayscale and just drag down the intensity to something really small. How about something like 0.2? And that really smooths these edges a bit more. And then we can refine it some more by after the blur high quality grayscale, focus it in with a histogram scan. I'm gonna bring up the contrast a bit and then just bring up this position. And so now we can refine that almost a mask in a way. 0.22 is good for the position there. And I'll just show you the difference. So here's the edge detect and here's everything with the histogram scan and the blur. Just smooths out that detail. So now we don't have those aliased edges. And then after the histogram scan, let's add an invert grayscale. I'll zoom out and you can see what our pattern looks like. Very cool. And to see what we're doing, let's hook this up to our final blend. So now we've got a really cool wiry circuity pattern going on here. But we're not done because now we're going to use a tile sampler and multiply this pattern all over the place. So for now, I'm going to reconnect the blend that we had before, the one that has our base shapes with these cages that we've made, and I'm just going to attach that back in. So I'm going to click off and add a tile sampler, and then I'm going to pump in our invert grayscale into the pattern one input and enable it by going into pattern input under pattern. and we're creating some bigger wires this time. So we're actually going to be doing a similar operation to what we did with our base shapes. In fact, we're going to do it twice more. One for bigger wires and once for a smaller micro detail. So right now we're working on the bigger wires. So in the tile sampler, I'm going to decrease the X and Y amounts so that we get a little less of these instances in our grid. And you don't always have to make these the same value. So I'm going to choose about five for the X amount, and I'm going to keep seven for the Y amount. Now, if we scroll down a bit, I'm going to go to the rotation random. Now, the rotation random under the pattern settings rotates these patterns at 90 degrees. So you can see as I drag this up, and you look in the 2D view over here, it's only rotating them by 90 degree increments. So yeah, I'm going to set this to one here, and then scroll down a bit, look at the scale parameter, and let's just bring this up. And you really, you don't need to do it too much. I think I'm gonna use something like 2.3. Yeah, something like 2.33. Now I've got a really complex set of wires here, just with a couple of sliders and the tile sampler. But I'm gonna direct this just a little bit more by going to the scale random, and I'm gonna adjust this a bit. And this is where you can really start to have fun with these shapes. Let's zoom out and see what we have here. And then, definitely going to go to the position random slider and see what we can do with that. All right, now that's looking really cool. So let's blend this on to see what we're doing. What I'm going to do is just click on my graph and add a blend. And I'm going to set it to subtract. And I know that in the background, I'm going to want my tile sampler. So I'm going to put the tile sampler into the background here. And now what I want to do is subtract the shapes that we have here so that we're left with all this extra space and that's where these wires can fill in the detail. So let's go back into our graph and we've got this blend here that has the, the cages that we've been working on and our base shapes. And so I'm going to drag off another connection from this blend. So I'm just going to drag it off over here and I'm going to look for a histogram scan. And I definitely use histogram scans a lot in all of my videos. It's perfect for making masks like this. So I'm going to drag the contrast up to one, and I'm going to drag up the position to something along the lines of 0.7 looks good. Yeah, we're getting a majority of those shapes here. And so now if I put this histogram scan into the foreground of our blend that's doing a subtract operation, we're now subtracting this histogram scan shape from these wires like so.
Now we could just blend on this shape onto the rest of our blend stack here, but I think there's a better way to do that. And I'm going to use a height blend and height blends make it easy to stack different height components on top of one another. So I'm going to click on my graph, hit spacebar and type in height blend. So height blend has a couple options. We have the height top, the height bottom, and this optional mask here. What I want to do is put the blend that we've been using back here, the one that has the cages and the main shapes, I'm going to put that into the height top because I want this to sit on top of the wires that I've created. So therefore, I'm going to take the blend that has our wires and put that into the height bottom. So I'll double click on this and this is what we're getting in our view. Now to see what we're doing in 3D, I'm just going to replace the foreground from our final blend with this blended height output from our height blend. And our wires are way too intense. You can see that they are they have an equal amount of height with our main base shapes, and that's not what we want. So I'm going to double click the height blend, and to bring the height top further higher, I'm going to increase the height offset. And what that does is it brings everything below it further down in the height scale. I'm going to look at the top of our cube and watch how I adjust the height offset. And if I bring this far enough to the right, the wires start to sink further into the ground. So now we're getting something a bit more like this, and that actually might be a bit too much. So I'm going to dial back the height offset just a tiny bit. So you can see our texture is coming along quite well so far, but we're not quite done yet. Not with these wires anyway. What I want to do is fill in these extra gaps with a bit more micro detail. And to do that, we're going to do the same exact thing. This time, we're just going to use smaller wires. So let's zoom out and look at what our graph looks like so far. We've got our height blend, and I'm going to continue that height line, that height timeline that we've been doing. And then I'm just going to bring our final blend and our outputs further over to the right so that we have more room to work. And I'm going to zoom in here to where our first tile sampler was, and I'm just going to create a new tile sampler. And as the input, I'm going to use the same invert grayscale that we used for the first tile sampler. So I'm going to pipe that into the pattern one input, double click the sampler, and then change the pattern to pattern input. And so because we want smaller wires this time, I'm going to keep the X and Y amount a bit higher so that we actually get a smaller result. So I'm going to increase the X amount to 21 is good, and then decrease the Y amount to 7 like we had before. And that's going to add some further detail and break up the uniformity a little bit. So like before, I'm going to scroll down to pattern and bring up the rotation random, and then scroll down a bit more to the size parameters and increase that scale again. Adjust the scale random. And then my favorite part, the position random. And so now we see we have these really fine wires and lines that we can blend in underneath the larger wires and lines. And that's going to be done again with another height blend. So after the first height blend that we have here and before our final blend, I'm going to select this connection, hit spacebar, and do a height blend. And by default, it's going to put our first height blend into the height bottom. I'm just going to shift click and move that into the height top. And then for the height bottom, let's grab our tile sampler and put that into the height bottom input. And you can see it freaks out a bit. Now let's crank up the height offset almost to the point where you can't really see it in the 2D view. 0.99 and then if we go to our 3d view and I control shift right click to move the light and alt right click to zoom in I hope you can see that we've got a very small hint of some extra wiring going on underneath the surface here so I'm going to select all of these nodes here none of the blends at the top but all of the ones that are building the, the cages and the wires and things like that I'm going to frame those up and I'll just call it wires. And now our graph's looking like this. So we've got our base shapes that are blending in those cages and the wires with those two height blends into our final blend. So 
what if we wanted to do something in particular to some of these squares? Like maybe we could turn some of these pieces into microchips by adding some lasered in text and some connector pins. Up next, I'd like to show you how to select some of these shapes procedurally and then apply some specific changes to them. In order to target specific blocks, we need to choose a part of the process that makes it easy to isolate them. I'm gonna scroll in here and I'm gonna choose this histogram scan because it has already isolated our shapes into these black and white islands. And so to be clear on which node this is, this is the histogram scan that goes into the invert grayscale and then goes into those two tile samplers that create our wires. So I'm gonna drag off a connection from that histogram scan and I'm gonna let go somewhere down here. And then I'm gonna search for the flood fill node. So the flood fill node takes those black and white islands and understands that each of those islands are a separate piece. And then we can therefore isolate those and do different things to them. Now that Substance Designer knows that each of these different islands are different pieces, we can use the family of flood fill nodes to target them and do different things to them. So after this flood fill node, I'm gonna click it, hit spacebar, type in flood fill and use flood fill to B box size. This node chooses a shade of gray based on the bounding box size of its particular island that it's looking at. This is great because it will allow us to select that grayscale value using our MVP, the histogram select. So after that flood fill to B box size, I'm gonna hit spacebar and get our histogram select. And just like before, we can scroll through that position and see all of those different grayscale values based on the bounding box size of those islands. To make it easier to select, I'm gonna drag the contrast all the way up to one. And I'm gonna bring the range all the way down to 0 0.01 because zero just brings it to full white. So 0 0.01, and then now we can go through the position and we can select all of our pieces here, which is really cool. So I'm looking for there, just those specific squares because they're just the right size and we can turn those into microchips pretty easily. So the idea is now to add some text onto each of these different microchips. So now that we've got these particular pieces selected here, this histogram select, I'm gonna add another flood fill node. And so now with that information, I'm gonna hit spacebar and type in flood fill and find the flood fill mapper grayscale. And this is the node that allows us to apply patterns and shapes to each individual island that we have with our flood fill. So we've put the B box output of the flood fill node into the flood fill B box. And if I bring this over, you can see we have a range of inputs here. And just like our tile sampler, we have a pattern one input. So let's put some text into that pattern one input. So I'm gonna click off my graph here, type in text, and I'm gonna come up with a fake brand name here, Micro Industries, and let's bring down the font size. And let's take that output of the text into the pattern one input in the flood fill mapper. You can double click that. And now you see that our text is being placed on top of where all those shapes are. Now, don't really want them to be horizontal like that, so if I double click the flood fill mapper, we've got some parameters that we can adjust, for instance, the rotation. So if you click on this rotation wheel and hold shift, you can snap it to 90 degrees. You can see they've all turned sideways here. And to see better what's going on, let's start adding this into our graph. So I'm gonna go all the way up to the top here, and I'm not gonna put this into the height information, I'm actually just gonna put it into the base color so that it looks like it's just resting on our particular microchips. So we've got this base color output here, and we've got this uniform color. So I'm gonna keep this uniform color because I just wanna blend on this new text. So between the uniform color and the base color output, I'm gonna hit space bar and add a blend. And then if we go back, and we take the output of our flood fill mapper grayscale. And I'm just holding down left click and using the scroll wheel to click and drag and scroll and navigate here. If I bring this into the foreground of this blend, you can see we've got a problem here. And that's because 
our flood fill mapper grayscale is giving in grayscale data and we need to deal with color data here. So what we can do is select this troublesome line, hit spacebar and just add a gradient map. And that's gonna convert it to color information. And I'm just gonna drag this up here to keep things organized. And then you can see what it's done here. Now it's, it's made everything dark and the text white. And so I kind of wanna invert that. So after the gradient map, we can use an invert color. And then because we don't want everything to be white, we have this opacity mask in our blend. And we already have a mask for that. And that's coming from our flood fill mapper. So I'm gonna drag another connection and bring that to this new blend with the uniform color into the opacity. So now you can see we have our laser non text here blending in with our uniform color. So overall, we've got that flood fill mapper node coming into this gradient map that's getting inverted into the foreground of a blend, the uniform color into the background, and then using again that flood fill mapper or grayscale as an opacity mask to blend these together just where the text is. And so now that I'm looking at it, it's looking okay, but I think I wanna adjust where this text is being placed on each of these shapes. So I can go back to our flood fill mapper grayscale, go to those parameters, and we should have something like an offset. Here we go. I'm gonna change the position offset on the X, and I'm just gonna slide over the text over to something like right about there. So it looks like it's being placed right on the edge there of each of our microchips. And if I zoom out here, you can see now we're getting a bit more of that detail. But there's even more to do. Now I wanna start creating some of those familiar connector pins around the border of our microchip. And so to do that, we need to isolate the vertical and the horizontal space of each chip. And I'm gonna show you how to do that now. So back down here where we've sort of got our microchip nodes going on here, I'm gonna find where we've isolated those chips. So we've got our flood fill node, our B box size, and then we have this histogram select. Now I'm just gonna make a tiny bit of room here. And after this histogram select, I'm gonna branch off a new connection and I'm gonna add a directional blur. And so you can see what it's done here. Based on this angle and intensity, it's blurred out these shapes. So right now I actually wanna look at the vertical space. So I'm going to click on the angle and like before, hold shift so it's gonna snap to 90 degrees here. The intensity is looking fine. And now we have this sort of gradient looking option, which is pretty neat in itself. I could probably use that in another material. And now to isolate the space that's going on around the microchip, I'm going to get a blend here plug the directional blur into the background and get our histogram we've been using into the foreground. And I'm gonna change this blend to a subtract. So now we just have those extra gradients. And then after that blend, I'm gonna add a histogram scan. Crank up the contrast to one and then bring up the position. And so now we're just selecting the areas on the top and bottom of that shape. I can choose how long I want these connector pins to be just by changing this position value here. So 0.68 is fine for me there. And now we just need to do the same thing to the horizontal space. So I'm just gonna select the directional blur, this blend and the histogram scan and hit Control D to duplicate them. And then I'm gonna double click our second blur and bring it back to zero in this case degrees and keep the intensity the same so now we've got the horizontal space vertical horizontal so now we've just created two different masks and what we're going to overlay with those masks are some lines so hit spacebar and to get some lines we need to search for stripes stripes is a great way to get lines like this and it comes in with uh, the lines being set to a diagonal. But if we take this shift property and bring it all the way to the left, you can see we now have horizontal lines. I'm going to heavily increase the amount of stripes that we have. In fact, I'm gonna type in a value like 300. That should be fine. You can see we've got those stripes. And I'm gonna keep the width at 0.5, softness and shift is good there. 
So we've got horizontal stripes, but now we need some vertical ones as well. So I'm going to branch off and get a safe transform grayscale and rotate this like before holding shift 90 degrees. And we have our two different stripes here. And now let's start blending them together. So clicking off in my graph, space bar, adding a blend and set to copy, which is fine. And then so for the vertical option, let's put the vertical histogram scan into the opacity and the vertical lines or stripes into the foreground. So now if I zoom out here, that's where our lines are. And let's do this the same way, but with our horizontal. So another blend, take the histogram scan with the horizontal, put that into the opacity and get the horizontal into the foreground. And now all we need to do is just add these two together. So one more blend, I'll put, it doesn't matter which one goes in where, but I'll put the vertical in the top, horizontal in the background, and then set the blending mode to add. And there we go, now I've got our shapes here. So no matter where these chips are, even if you adjust the random seed, as long as there's a chip or a box that's this particular size, it will add these pins around it. Now, before we add that in, I'm gonna do one more thing. And because I know that if we zoom in here, these values are gonna be a bit harsh, just like before, we need to soften these edges so that we don't get any tearing. So what I'm gonna do is select the blend that has both of these horizontal and vertical pins and add a bevel. And the distance is way too high, so I'm gonna manually type in a number really small, like 0 0.001. And yeah, so that's done a little bit of anti-aliasing for us. And then one more thing, this, uh, this node was added in a later version of Designer. If you select the bevel, hit spacebar and type in FXAA, as far as I understand it, this is an algorithm used by game engines to further reduce aliasing. And there's no parameters, but it just adds a little bit more softness if I double click the bevel and then double click this new FXAA grayscale. You can see it just softens it just a bit more. So if you find yourself having some tearing issues, I try adding a bevel and also this particular FXAA algorithm. See if that fixes it for you. And now to add this onto our blend stack, let's make some more room. I'm just gonna drag these nodes over and I'm gonna select the connection between our height blend, the last height blend, and our final blend. So I'm just gonna select that and add a regular blend here. And so for this blend, I'm gonna change the blending mode. I'm gonna set it to max lighten, and then find this FXAA grayscale, and bring that into the foreground as the other blends are automatically in the background. So there now you can see we've got our pins and they're looking a bit tall. So let's adjust the opacity of this blend a little bit. They're starting to come down. In fact, our height scale is a bit high. So let's go back to materials in our 3D view, hit edit. And I'm just gonna bring the scale down. So that's looking a bit more realistic here. That's better. Back into that blend that we were just adjusting, the one with max light and and we can dial in how much we want our pins here to be sticking out. I'm gonna choose something like 0.83. And there we go. We've got some microchips on our circuit board here. And so you can do this process, this microchip process going on here, where we've got the flood fill into B box size, where we've used the histogram select to select just this particular piece, but you can select more pieces in change those pieces to your heart's content and really procedurally affect them just like we did with this microchip so you can add even more detail. So like before, I'm gonna select these nodes and frame them up. I think to make the process a bit easier to understand, I'm gonna select the flood fill and B box size nodes and hit spacebar and frame them. I'm just gonna call this frame object isolation. So then you can go back and see, okay, so I know we've isolated our objects here. Now I can just add more histogram selects off of here. And then I will take, because we're just making microchips with these nodes, I'll select these, frame them up. Let's move that over a little bit. Call this microchip. 
And so that is our graph. You can see we've got this really cool, highly detailed texture here with just a couple of nodes. So I'm going to change the scene here, go to uh, Sphere, two tiles. And we want to look at this a little differently. I'm going to go to Materials, Edit, and scroll down to the bottom. And we can adjust the tiling here just globally. So I'm going to switch this to uh, 2. We can take a look at this on a sphere. And so, yeah, this is really just a jumping off point for you to create complex sci-fi patterns with just a couple of nodes. And this is what our graph looks like. It's We've got our base shapes, adding in some wires, and then we just added some extra detail here with the microchip. And there you have it. By starting off with a simple pattern like the tile random node, we can enhance it a little and then multiply it around to create something infinitely more complex. Having said that, it is important to add visual rest to your textures so that the eye can decide on what to look at. I hope you enjoyed this video as it is a jump off point in creating more complex patterns. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up. It lets me know that you enjoyed this type of content. And if you'd like to see more, hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos. There are plenty of more tutorials to come. So until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.